Welcome to Earth Day 2020, and thank you for having me here. Today, I want to take you into the future, the future of energy and transportation. But before I do that, I want to take you to the past. This is New York City 1900, uh, Easter Parade. Can anyone see the one car in that picture? We used horses as our main means of transportation for thousands of years, and there is one car in this picture there. You can barely see it. New York City, Easter Parade, 1913. Can anyone see the one horse in that picture? 13 years, that's all it took for the last major disruption of transportation on Earth. 13 years. Now, what is a technology disruption? A technology disruption is essentially when a new product or service uh, creates a new market and at the same time or eventually either destroys or dramatically transforms an existing industry. Um, and it's not just about destruction, it's also about creation. This is Ford Motor Company in 1913. This, this was the largest car company on earth uh, back then. And disruptions also change our tastes and preferences. It's not usually a one-to-one -one, uh, change. Transportation disruptions, for instance, can bring a food disruption. So what happened to all those horses? We ate them. I'm not saying you ate them, but we ate them. Um, and it became actually fashionable at the time to eat horses as clean meat. Um, and it's usually the experts and the insiders and the mainstream analysts who totally don't get disruption, who totally dismiss disruption. Not gonna happen, or it may take a long time, and so on and so forth. And companies and industries that look indestructible, remember Nokia, essentially can flip in a second. Um, so let me take you to 1985, when the then largest telecom company on earth, AT&T, hired McKinsey and company, and they asked them one question. What's going to be the adoption of this new thing called mobile phones or cell phones by the year 2000? So give me a 15 year projection. McKinsey went off and did whatever it is that they do and they came back with this number, 900,000. In 15 years, you're gonna have 900,000 subscribers to mobile phones. The actual number was 109 million. This is not a small mistake. This was a factor of 120 times. My little dog could do better than that, 120 times. Now, ask yourself, who can predict 15 years out? Can anyone do that? Well, check this out. In 2005, I posted this portfolio. It's a technology disruption portfolio that I called Winners Take All. My book back then was called Winners Take All. That portfolio has returned 2,600% in 15 years. And just to compare, the Dow Jones has grown by about 300% and the NASDAQ by about 430%. So this disruption portfolio was not just about destruction, it was about creation. Three companies in this portfolio are now worth more than a trillion dollars each in market valuation. So it is possible to predict 15 years out. But my question today and always, and for the last 15 years, has been why do smart people in smart organizations consistently, consistently, fail to anticipate, let alone lead, technology disruptions. And so I have created a framework uh, that I call SIBA Technology Disruption Framework to anticipate, to understand and anticipate disruptions. Um, I'll walk you through how that works and then I'll go into the disruption of energy and transportation. One of the things that I pay attention to is technology cost curves. So, a lot of the technologies that you see out there, computing, data storage, digital imaging, and so on, 
have a cost curve. So essentially, on a per year basis, you can calculate, uh, these are usually public figures, what the rate of improvement of those technologies are. Transistor count, um, you know, pixel count per year, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I pay attention to that. One important thing is that um, technology adoption and linear analysts, mainstream analysts miss this all the time. Every single technology adoption happens as an S-curve, not a line, an S-curve, right? So you may not see the initial adoption when it's below 1%, 2% of the market, but when it hits that, then you see this phenomenal growth and within a few months or years, it's pretty much over. And again, I've studied te technology disruptions over thousands of years. Not a single one happens linearly. They're all S-curves. Um, so back to the car versus the horse. Um, the car, when we look at all of America, the car market share went up over 20 years to 95% of the whole country. But that's not interesting. Here's what's interesting. From about 11% to about 81%, so basically the S-curve happened over 10 years. That's it, 10 years. And that was the end of the disruption. Not only that, the disruption took place while we built two brand new industries, the car industry and the oil industry, a brand new road infrastructure. We fought a major war and we fought a global pandemic. So pandemics are not new, right? Um, so while all of that happened, the disruption took place in 10 years. Um, so a lot of times the mainstream analysts will tell you infrastructure disruptions happen over 40 years, 60 years, 100 years, not true. If you look for instance at the shipping container port infrastructure, the S-curve, right, happened from tipping point to about 80%. Uh, that is the fastest part of the adoption, essentially happened over 14 years. And this is shipping containers. So essentially 87% of countries had already adopted shipping container ports um, within 14 years. And what this did uh, was disrupt places like New York and London as world kind of biggest ports in the world. Uh, and now, of course, as you know, most of them are in Asia, Shanghai, Singapore, Shenzhen, um, and Dubai, and so on and so forth. So infrastructures can also be disrupted quickly. And technology adoption curves are accelerating. I mean, if you feel that things are happening a lot more quickly, it's because they are happening a lot more quickly. Um, now, what actually enables major adoptions is not just technologies per se, but the convergence. So if you ask yourself, why did the smartphone disruption happen in 2007? Not 2005, not 2009, 2007. Why did both Apple and Google came up with their smartphones in 2007? That's because the convergence, essentially all the technologies that were necessary for a $600 smartphone converged that year, 2007. And that's another lesson of disruption, which is it usually happens from the outside. Neither Apple nor Google had ever built a phone before. And now they, of course, own most of the world's um, operating smartphone operating system market. So it's convergence that enables the major disruptions. Business model innovation is also uh, hugely disruptive. And uh, you know Uber, you know Lyft and DD and Ola and so on. Uber was started uh, in a, an apartment in San Francisco, 2009, two years after the smartphone came out. 2009, not coincidental. Seven years later, Uber had more bookings than the whole taxi industry in America. 
So again, anyone who tells you that a transportation disruption cannot happen in seven years is not looking at reality, is not looking at the evidence. Just eight years before both Uber and Lyft uh, had 20% of all the vehicle miles traveled in major cities like San Francisco. So what I look at is if it went from zero to 20% of the market in just eight years, what's it gonna take for them to go from 20 to 100, right? If that's gonna happen, and I'll come back to that. But one of the disruptions that I predicted, one of the things that I said years ago was that 2020 is going to be the peak of new, internal combustion engine car purchases, 2020. Now, I was off by just a few months. It actually happened in 2019 because of things like uh, Uber and Lyft and so on. So when you look at worldwide, America, and this is before COVID-19, America, Europe, India, China, uh, 2019, essentially new car sales went down not for electric vehicles, but for internal combustion engine vehicles. So another of my predictions that came in almost to the year, but essentially to the month. Um, now, another thing that you need to take into account when you talk about disruptions is what I call market trauma. And the idea is that swift, non-linear, disproportional financial impact happens upfront in disruptions. So the fallacy from mainstream analysts is, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it's gonna take 10 years, 20 years for a lot of adoption for 50% of 30% or 80% adoption of the new, whether that means autonomous technology or electric vehicles or solar or whatever. Well, it's usually not true, but even if it were, that doesn't mean that the incumbents are not gonna be wiped out up front. And we're living that now with COVID-19. Uh, it's a disruption, not technology, that essentially caused us trauma up front, way before the adoption of, uh, well, of, of the virus uh, went up to high penetration, right? So market trauma can happen up front. And um, you know, look at GE, for instance. And I'm going to come back to that. GE's market valuation dropped by about 74% a couple of years ago because uh, essentially they invested in fossil fuel, central power generation. And, and of course, folks are telling them, don't worry about it. By 2040, uh, the soonest, uh, solar and batteries and so on uh, are going to make a difference in that market. Well, that is not true. But also, even if that were true, you're going to be hurt up front. And GE proved that that's what happened. Now, what are the key technologies that I'm looking at personally uh, in terms of their capability to uh, disrupt all industries over the next decade? So I've been telling you for years that the decade of the 2020s is going to be the most disruptive decade in history. Um, for all kinds of reasons, but from a technology disruption perspective, we're gonna see massive disruptions. Um, and so this is my framework, the technology disruption framework. Um, and based on this, in 2014, I wrote a book called Clean Disruption of Energy and Transportation. Now, executive summary, there are four technologies, batteries, electric vehicles, autonomous technology, on-demand transportation um, and solar, that all of them, all of them are disruptive in their own way, but together the convergence of these technologies and business model innovations are going to be super disruptive for energy and transportation. So let me walk you through how that is gonna happen and what I predicted started, starting uh, 2014. So six years ago, this is the exact cost curve that uh, essentially I, I put in my book. 
the projected cost curve of lithium ion batteries on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis. And of course, at the time, mainstream analysts said, you're insane, it's not gonna happen and so on. Well, I assumed that um, it would go down at about 16% per year. And it's actually uh, gone faster than that, faster. And, and you know, they said, no, it was, it's not gonna happen. Now, why is it going faster? Uh, because over the last six years, uh, the number of mega factories, the scale of this industry has gone berserk. Um, there were three lithium ion mega factories in the pipeline six years ago. Now there are 121. So the scale, the innovation, the new markets, and so on, essentially mean that the, the, the cost curve has accelerated to 20 plus percent per year. So all my predictions are actually accelerating, um, which is great. Um, and this is not just causing trauma, disruptions in uh, transportation, energy. I mean, you probably have heard of the South Australia battery that is already disrupting the fossil fuel infrastructure there. So the wholesale market uh, for uh, services, uh, essentially the, 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 the battery, the Hornsdale battery, within weeks of being switched on. And with just 2% of the market, of the frequency control and ancillary services market, with just 2% of that capacity, it wiped out 90% of the revenues of the incumbent industry. 2% just within a few uh, days. It wiped out 90%. This is what I call market trauma. So you don't need a big penetration. You don't need 20 years to essentially disrupt the finances of the incumbents. Um, now grids, uh, grid batteries are super disruptive, both on the demand side and on the supply side. Why? Because our existing grid is extremely inefficient. It's, it's an inefficient, uh, just-in-time supply chain. So essentially, about a third of the assets in the existing um, central generation uh, grid are peakers. Uh, and peakers are super inefficient. They can only be used a few hours, a few dozen hours. So uh, batteries on the demand side or on the supply side can disrupt them right away. Uh, so this is a lot of billions of dollars that are going to be wiped out. And the disruption is from above. Essentially first, ancillary services, then peakers, which is already happening, and then baseload, okay? Um, and all of these assets are gonna be stranded. Every new fossil fuel generation is going to be stranded. Even every existing fossil fuel generation is gonna be stranded. And I predicted this years ago, right? Um, so now all over the world, we're building far bigger uh, battery, uh, grid batteries. And in fact, uh, the market is saying, forget those natural gas speakers, those new natural gas speakers, we would rather put up um, new grid batteries. So disruption is already starting to happen. Now, when the cost curve of batteries essentially goes down the way that it has, um, yes, the grid is gonna be disrupted. What else is gonna be disrupted? The auto industry. So disruption number two, electric vehicles. Now, this is a picture from 10 years ago. And the question is, as it was back then, um, is the electric vehicle disruptive? Or is it just a commie, greeny, you know, conspiracy against the oil industry? And so uh, let me walk you through some of the reasons why EVs are disruptive. Uh, one is that they are about 10 times cheaper to charge, depending on the market, right? Five, maybe 10 times to charge on a per mile basis compared to gasoline, 10 times. Every time you see a 10X, watch out. Um, also, EVs have so few parts, moving parts, maybe 20 or a few dozen 
as opposed to internal combustion engines, which have thousands, 2,000, 3,000 moving parts. So essentially, EVs are almost free to maintain. They're at least 10 times cheaper to maintain, which is why EV companies can give you infinite mile warranty. Why? Because they can, because these things don't break. Now, one thing that has been ignored by the market is that by mainstream analysts, uh, is that EVs are not a one-to-one -one disruption. An EV can go 500,000 miles. An internal combustion engine, a gasoline or diesel car can only go about 140,000 miles. So an EV can last three times longer than uh, an internal combustion engine car. Now, uh, Tesla and others have announced a million mile EV, which means that an EV can last up to seven times longer than um, you know, a diesel or gasoline vehicle. Now, we only drive about 10,000 miles per year, which means that we would need 50 years to drive uh, an EV. Who has 50 years, right? Well, if you live in Cuba, you do, right? Um, but fleets drive about 100,000 miles per year. So if you're a fleet over five years, you would need one EV or three ICE vehicles. So if you're a fleet, Amazon, FedEx, UPS, and so on, right now, it makes economic sense for you to buy an EV. And that's because over five years, it would be a lot cheaper. You would need one EV or essentially three I, uh, ICE vehicles. Now, um, what about the cost curve of EVs? Again, this was the cost curve that I published six years ago. And I said, by 2020, by this time now, you will see the market is going to offer 200 mile electric vehicles. And I always thought that 200 mile was the minimum that you need for mainstream adoption. So by now, it would offer $30,000 EVs, uh, which would be cheaper than the median new internal combustion engine car. So by now, and I made this prediction years ago, six years ago, buying a new EV, certain new EVs, not all of them, is cheaper than buying a new internal combustion engine vehicle. So for less money, you get three to seven times longer range. You get to pay 10 times less uh, fuel. You get to essentially have a car with no maintenance, car that's more powerful. What do you think the market's gonna do? This is the moment of disruption, right? So if it takes another year, right, the tipping point, 2021, and I made that prediction a long time ago, 2021. The other thing that this map is telling you is this, by 2025 or so, you're going to have, the market is going to offer unsubsidized EVs with 200 mile range for $12,500 by 2025, which means that every new vehicle by 2025 will be electric. Every new car will be electric. Every new van will be electric for purely economic reasons. And that's by 2025, right? Every new vehicle, mainstream vehicle by 2025. This is not 2040, we're talking about 2025, right? And this doesn't include that, that all the negative feedback loops. So I predicted also that the resale value of gasoline and diesel cars were going to crash. So when resale value crashes, that means that the, uh, the, 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 the monthly payments for your car are gonna go up necessarily, right? Uh, and that is starting to happen. And you're gonna see that happen a lot more. So pay attention to the plunging resale value of gasoline and diesel cars. And not only that, vans, buses, um, you know, trucks, 
everything that moves on four wheels is going to be new, electric by 2025. And of course, the whole market for internal combustion engine automobiles will be wiped out by 2030. And this all includes a one-to-one. -one. I haven't talked about the other elements, the real convergence that is going to make uh, transportation just go into a big disruption starting next year, probably. Um, so by next year or the year after that, you know, I predicted by 2022, you're going to see $22,000 EVs with 200 mile range uh, for $22,000. Now, uh, what do we see now? Uh, Amazon fleet announced that they're going to buy 100,000 vans from uh, Rivian, which is a new electric vehicle company. 100,000, starting when? 2021. So the tipping point is going to be 2021, as I predicted in 2014. Uh, and all of these, according to Amazon, are going to be hitting the road by 2024. Now, why Amazon? Well, again, fleet. They drive vans 100,000 miles per year. That means if they need one van over five years or three vans uh, if they're gasoline or diesel. So it makes total sense. Now, there are many other reasons why you would want an EV, right? I mean, an EV essentially can uh, serve both as a backup for your own home power. Uh, and so you can, uh, an EV is uh, a computer on wheels with a big battery. A 200 mile EV has the capacity for about two days of the average electricity consumption of the average American home. Two days of electricity. So not only can you charge your EV with your solar panels, with your home, but you also, you can charge your home with your EV. This is not a technology problem. This is a regulatory problem, right? And if you add up all those EVs, when there is a the disruption of transportation, and essentially all uh, vehicles are electric, which uh, I'm going to tell you when, um, about 71% of Canada's daily electricity demand can be stored in cars. 71%. Um, this is super disruptive. Try that with your gasoline or diesel vehicles, 71%. Now, EVs are disruptive, like I said. Um, let me talk to you about autonomous vehicles. Right? You've seen this, you've probably seen. You can see that at home, um, but essentially level four autonomous vehicles are already being, we, we can see them. Uh, I can on the road uh, now. That video is from Arizona, where Google uh, Waymo has hundreds of autonomous vehicles on the road. Now, there are dozens and dozens of corporations around the world investing billions, tens of billions of dollars to be first in autonomous technology, level four autonomous technology. Now, why are companies investing? Why are they rushing to be the first or second in autonomous technology? Well, here's why. One thing that we learned from disruptions in, computer, uh, in computers, right? Uh, whether it's personal computers, uh, uh, smartphones, laptops, um, and so on, is that uh, all you need is one company to be ready, and basically you have a market. So. Apple did not wait for anybody else before they went out with the iPhone, right? Once iOS was ready, boom, they went to market. So all you need is one company to be ready with level four autonomous technology for that market to get started. And the other lesson is that only two, because of the network effects of this technology, because level four autonomy is like an operating system. And if you look at operating systems for computers, um, 
two companies, two operating systems usually dominate those markets. So iOS and Android, uh, Apple and Windows, and so on. So essentially, only two companies are going to dominate the autonomous technology market, right? Everyone else, goodbye, right? At least in, in, in their own market. Um, and we can see from the announcements that companies are investing billions of dollars in new cars. So Waymo uh, announced that they ordered 62,000 uh, autonomous vehicles, 62,000. And this is the equivalent of 10% of, 10 of the vehicle miles traveled in Arizona, for instance, just 62,000 cars that go 100,000 miles per year. Um, but, you know, you hear a lot in the mainstream media, although this is changing now with COVID-19, that, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles are not safe and so on. Now, the reality, if you just look at Tesla and, and they publish uh, macro data, uh, Teslas with autopilot are already 6.4 times safer than the average car in America. Already, this is not level four technology, not even close. And it's already 6.4 times safer than the average car in America, already. Now, if all cars, according to Tesla, had their autopilot, uh, or actually if all cars were Teslas with autopilot, we could save 900,000 lives worldwide because we kill 1.3 million, 1.2, 1.3 million uh, people in car accidents every year. Already, this technology is safer, six times safer than uh, human beings. Now, what is the cost curve? How quickly is this going to happen? So one thing for computing power. So we need a lot of teraflops, right? A lot of computing power to make uh, an autonomous vehicle uh, possible. Now, just to give you an idea, this was the world's largest, most powerful supercomputer in the year 2000. It cost nearly $50 million, and it was the size of a big room, right? Um, and so this is Jensen Wang, the CEO of NVIDIA, showing a, an eight teraflops computer. Now, let me take you back. In 2000, one teraflops, $50 million. In 2016, eight teraflops, 600 bucks. That's an improvement in 16 years of 650,000 times. Thousand times, right? Not just 10%, 600,000 times. And if you look at your Apple 10, if you have an Apple 10, their uh, chip has five teraflops. So it's five times bigger. I mean, in 2000, that kind of power would have cost you $250 million. What does it cost you today? Nothing. It comes built into the Apple 10. So that's how quickly that technology is uh, improving, which is why companies like NVIDIA and Tesla are uh, basically developing uh, computers in the teraflops, hundreds of teraflops which is what's going to enable level four and level five autonomy. Now, I talk about cars, but essentially everything on wheels is going to be autonomous. Everything on wheels. Delivery of food, which is what we need today in this COVID crisis. Delivery of medicine, delivery of packages, trucks. Uh, I mean, that's me in an autonomous wheelchair in Singapore. Right? So essentially anything that moves, because again, uh, all the technologies are getting to be so cheap. Um, and also because autonomous technology is like an operating system. If it works for one computer, you can actually uh, port it to bigger computers and, and, and smaller computers. Now, what is the big disruption? So I talked about Uber on demand transportation. I talked about electric vehicles and I talked about autonomous vehicles right? What is the disruption, really, of transportation? So all of these are disruptive independently. But the big disruption of transportation 
So I published in 2017, um, essentially a book called Rethinking Transportation 2020-2030, where I go more in depth about how this disruption is going to unfold. The disruption is the convergence of autonomous, electric, and on-demand transportation. Now, transport as a service, TAS, is what, why is it so disruptive? For one thing, we only use our cars 4% of the time. They're parked 96% of the time. Huge asset inefficiency, huge asset waiting to be disrupted. Um, so when you have fleets driving cars, when they are autonomous and when they are on demand, essentially driving time go, goes from 4% to 40% of the time, from 10,000 miles to 100,000 miles per year. And this is what you get. Now, fleets don't have to wait, like I said, for autonomy, right? I mean, just the fact that their EV uh, can uh, basically means that they have to go electric, right? By next year, starting next year. Um, but why? Because on a per mile basis, uh, fleet EVs are gonna be about a third cheaper than diesel or, I mean, any combustion engine uh, vans. Now, autonomous vehicles, and DD has announced, of course, that they're gonna have a million autonomous and electric vehicles by 2020, by this year. It may not happen this year, but uh, you know they said that they already had 600,000 uh, as of last year. Now, TAS, again, is on demand, autonomous and electric, owned by fleets, not individual, fleet ownership. And that's, so that's a disruption, not only of, of petroleum, it's also a disruption of a business model where individuals are not gonna own cars anymore. Why? Because again, assume that level four autonomous vehicles are available and approved by the regulators, which is important, next year, 2021. That year, the cost per mile of TAS is going to be up to a 10th, 10x cheaper than the cost per mile of owning a car. So, you know, essentially we pay ten, twelve thousand dollars a year to own a car, all in, right? Um, so if this happens, TAS happens next year, the day that TAS is available in a city, London, San Francisco, New York, Beijing, Shanghai, um, this is the, the decision that someone is gonna have to make. Do I wanna spend $50,000 over the next five years, owning a car, any car? Or do I wanna spend $100 a month for a subscription, like a Netflix, for a subscription to transport as a service? No brainer. Every time there's been a 10X improvement in cost, there's been a disruption in all of history, in 10,000 years. Every time we've seen a 10X, we've seen a disruption. So again, assuming that 2021 is the tipping point, um, which it's looking like, uh, essentially what happens? Cost per mile 10 times cheaper, people stop buying new cars. And that's gonna be big, right? So uh, essentially, not only that, transport as a service is going to be cheaper even than uh, operating a car that you already own. So even if you paid it off, the cost of just gasoline, parking, um, maintenance, and so on, of an existing car is going to be a lot higher, two to four times higher than the cost of transport as a service. So it's gonna be a no brainer. Even if people don't sell their cars right away, eventually they will. Because why would they wanna pay two to four times more for owning and maintaining a car than for something else that's more convenient. Now, you know, when I came up with uh, uh, this TAS idea, of course, mainstream analysts said that, that I was insane. They usually do, but you know, I'm usually five, 10, 15 years ahead of them. Um, so Tesla, Elon Musk recently announced 
that their task uh, essentially offering is going to cost about 18 cents per mile, which is more or less what uh, within the range of what I'm saying. 18 cents, right? Um, so essentially, the industry is going that way. Now, what happens if TAS happens 2021? Well, essentially, within 10 years, it's a 10-year disruption. By 2030, 95% of vehicle miles, uh, passenger miles, are going to be TAS, autonomous, electric, and on-demand, by 2030, 95%. Now, we're going to drive, we're not, but fleets are, 50% more miles for a lot less, right? Because we're only going to pay a tenth on a per mile basis. The implications are astonishing. For one, we're going to stop buying new cars. Uh, and then we're going to get rid of our cars, which means that um, annual demand for new vehicles is going to shrink by about 70%, starting over the next couple of years, shrink by 70%. Now, this sounded insane about three years ago when I first said it, but look at the figures now from another disruption, right? It's a different disruption, but what the disruption that we're seeing today shows is what's possible, right? Three years ago, a lot of people didn't think it was possible. Now it's happening for another reason, but it's happening. So. Yeah, over the next 10 years, the total size of the U.S. fleet is going to shrink by about 80%. So we're going to have 20% fewer cars on the road. Now, not everybody's going to give up their cars. Even by 2030, I expect uh, about 60% of cars essentially to be um, fleet and 40% to be individually owned. But fleets are going to drive 100,000 miles and individuals drive 10,000, which means that 95% of miles are going to come from fleets, which are going to be electric. Um, more implications, huge implications. Every family in America uh, is going to get back to save $5,600 per year, which means that U.S. disposable income will increase by about a trillion dollars per year, forever, right? Um, and our additional productivity boost by not having to drive, then we can work or study or do whatever while we not drive. That's another trillion dollars. I mean, this is bigger than any tax benefits ever. This is the biggest boost to the economy, right? Um, environment. There is an 80% decrease in energy consumption just by going all electric. Just by going all electric, we save 80% of energy, 90% decrease in CO2 emission. And did I say we're going to get money back? This is not going to cost us money. We're going to get money back and decrease in CO2 by 90%. Um, we're going to save a million plus lives per year because, like I said, autonomous vehicles are far safer and will be getting safer and safer by by the minutes uh, going forward. Um, implications for the oil industry. Well, this is what I predicted uh, in 2017 and what I predicted also in 2014. Oil demand is gonna peak at about 100 million barrels per day, 2020, this year. And it's gonna drop to 70 million barrels per day by 2030. Again, I was called insane. It's not going to happen. It's not. Oil demand is not going to go down by 30 million barrels per day. Well, guess what happened? Well, also, when it goes down to 70 million barrels per day, what happens to the cost? Well, the whole demand doesn't need to go down by that much in order for oil prices to crash. So my prediction was that oil cost in the world markets would go down to about $25 per barrel as soon as 2021, right? Again, even a few months ago, uh, mainstream analysts said, not going to happen, right? That oil would go down to 20 or 25. Well, guess what? It already has. 
It already has. This is what we saw last week and this week. World demand went down to 70 million barrels per day because of another disruption, right? And cost of oil in the markets went down to 20. What I told you many years ago, right? If you paid attention to what I said, you may have saved money, right? Boom, $20 and minus $30 million demand already in 2020. Now, this is what happens when oil goes down to $20. Oil sands, gone, right? Stranded forever. Oil that is not, that can't compete at $20, at $25 in the market is stranded forever. Not just oil, refineries, pipelines that depend on those expensive oil, right? Offshore, deep water, gone. Shale, gone. You can't compete at 20 or 25, gone. Those assets are stranded. It's happening already, like I said. Not only that, it's even worse than what I said would happen. Over the last few days, oil went into negative territory. Zero, less than zero. People were paying for, for, for others to take oil off their hands. This was inconceivable just a few months ago. It's happening already. And this is the shape of things to come. This is the collapse of the oil industry. Okay, now it's going to recover temporarily, but this is what we're gonna see soon. Minus 30 million barrel demand and oil prices at about 20 or 25, just like I predicted. So implications for land use and real estate. Um, cities are about a third of the land mass is parking. Uh, and of course, parking is gonna be obsolete because we're not gonna own cars. What are we gonna do with the 80 or 90% of that land mass that's going to free up for other uses? Well, we're gonna redesign our cities. Green parks, check. Walkable space, check. Social space, check. New businesses, yes. Um, residential development, uh, affordable housing, check. A third almost of the land mass of cities is going to open up. Um, and did I tell you we're gonna get money back for that? So I did the numbers for Los Angeles. And in LA with the free parking space, you'll be able to build three cities the size of San Francisco, three whole cities. So a city like LA is going to have to make a decision. Do we want a desert uh, in the middle of the city or do we want to create the wealth of three cities the size of San Francisco? And just to show you how that disruption is already happening, the disruption of transportation is enabling a disruption of food. The largest parking operator in the US is a cloud kitchen company, which is a food preparation kitchen for delivery only already. So that is happening and that's going to uh, grow in the uh, 2020s. Now, last but not least, I want to talk about the solar disruption. And I want to start in Denmark. And some of you may be from Denmark. But Denmark, Copenhagen is three degrees south of Juneau, Alaska. It's not the place you would think of when you think solar. And yet, this school in Copenhagen generates 50% of its annual energy needs from solar, from solar energy. Um, no excuse as to whether a place can uh, generate at least 50% with solar. And solar, as you know, has decreased in cost by at least 400 times, 400 times since 1970. I mean, it has a learning curve of about 22%, um, and it's going to keep going down. And at the same time, since the year 2000, um, solar has grown 
uh, the installed base by about 460 times, which is about 38% per year. Now that keeps growing and it's gonna be over uh, sooner than, I mean, the disruption is gonna happen very soon. But the question is, can solar continue growing at this rate? Um, so let's step back and look at the solar cost trends versus conventional energy. Utility scale solar, is already below two cents, depending on where you build it. Two cents, three cents, three and a half cents. Below two, unsubsidized solar is below two cents. Qatar, 1.5 cents. Dubai, 1.7 cents. Um, and, and, and it's still going down. Every time that a mainstream analyst says it can't go down anymore, it does go down. Uh, where is solar now? Well, utility scale solar is cheaper than natural gas, coal, and nuclear already. Any new natural gas, coal, or nuke uh, built today is gone, is stranded because it can't compete. In fact, solar with a battery with four hours of storage is cheaper than the operating cost of coal, nukes, oil, or gas. Repeat, the total cost of solar plus four hours of battery is cheaper than just the operating cost of coal, nukes, oil, and gas. The disruption is here. It's over for all these fossil fuel and nuclear generation options. It's over. And I told you about GE. GE bet that it wasn't going to be over in 20 years. And because of that, we got a market trauma. GE destroyed almost $200 billion in market valuation, 74% of its market cap in less than two years, because it doubled down on thermal power construction. Um, and supposedly this collapse caught GE by surprise. Well, hello, you should have listened to me, right? Coal already collapsed. This is the Dow Jones coal index, US coal index. Its market value of coal has already collapsed since 2008 by 99%. Repeat, in 12 years, the market valuation of the coal industry in America has dropped by more than 99%. It's already collapsed. Oil has collapsed. Coal has collapsed. Natural gas is on its way. Nukes, well, it happened already a long time ago. Over, people, gone. Now, a lot of folks talk about grid parity, and I already told you about it. Two cents for utility-scale solar, right? Um, but is grid parity the tipping point? Well, let's talk about it. Um, you know, in China and you know, in most uh, cities around the world, commercial and industrial rooftop solar, unsubsidized, is already cheaper uh, than grid, right? Than whatever you can buy uh, electricity on the grid. Now, again. The experts had said that uh, it would take decades for this to happen. And yet, in 344 cities in China, solar on the rooftop is already cheaper without subsidies than grid electricity. And this takes us to what I call God parity. God parity is the point of no return. So what else, God, what is God parity? It's when the cost of solar rooftop generation on your rooftop, whether it's residential, commercial, or industrial, falls below the cost of transmission, not just the cost of, uh, that you buy grid electricity, the cost of transmission. Now, in some places, transmission is really expensive, 12 cents per kilowatt hour in uh, places like uh, Australia. Right? So when you can generate for less than the cost of transmission, 
that means that even if the utility can generate at zero dollars per kilowatt hour, which of course is not possible, solar is getting there, but not quite zero. When you add the cost of transmission, and of course, you know, uh, utility, CEO, and salary, and so on, it's never going to be able to compete with your own rooftop generation. That is called parity. So essentially, utility scale, grade electricity will never be able to compete with uh, your own generation. That is called parity. Mathematically, it's impossible for the utility to compete. And that's the tipping point. That, assuming regulation, allows solar to happen, which right now is the, is the main uh, challenge. Um, essentially, that's the tipping point. Anytime the cost of solar falls below the cost of transmission, that's the tipping point. That's when everybody's best selfish economic interest tells them to put up solar on the rooftop because of purely economic reasons. And we are here. Um, a lot of places around the world are already uh, below God parity. New builds, uh, residential in California, in Australia. A lot of places are already. That's why, according to PwC, more than two thirds of corporations are actively pursuing solar purchases. That's because of purely economic reasons. And this is a double disruption for nukes and natural gas and uh, coal and, and oil and so on. So every factory, every warehouse, every building, every house uh, is going to have to have um, solar and later batteries for purely economic reasons. Um, let me plug my latest report on rethinking food and agriculture. If you haven't read it, please do. It's free on rethinkx.com. Um, the disruption of food and agriculture in the 2020s will be every bit as consequential and as large as the disruptions in energy and transportation that I just talked about. So let me take you back to the future. I started with the horses and the disruption of the cars. Um, we are here. 2020, we're driving typewriters on wheels. And if you don't know what a typewriter is, I've made my point. They were wiped out very quickly by PCs. Um, and over the next 10 years, we're going to see the deepest, fastest, most consequential disruption of energy, transportation, food, infrastructure, the urban landscape that we've ever seen in history. And it's gonna happen in the 2020s. Um, and just again, to remind you, this is not an energy transition. This is a technology disruption. It's gonna happen despite governments, not because of governments. It's gonna happen for purely economic reasons. Thank you.